Hello and a warm welcome back to the sweet spot here on the Racing Post, your go-to golf tipping show. Bruce Millington is tanning himself in the lovely Mykonos this week. So it's me, Jack Reeve, back with Steve Palmer to guide you through proceedings. We're going to be looking back on two tournaments where Steve Palmer had an excellent week, as well as looking to two cracking events coming up on Thursday. Steve, I hope you're well. We'll get into uh, proceeding shortly. I just wanted to give a few people little shout outs from YouTube because I know you don't often delve into the comments. You're not a fan of the thumbs down. But last week's episode, loads of thumbs up, only two thumbs down. Andy Turner, great tip, Steve. Sam Burns steams in and Joachim Lagergren comes home at a large East each way price. Roll on the next sweet spot. Martin McKibben, great tipping, Steve. Followed you for 15 years through many highs and lows. Glad to see you back where you belong. And Neil Evans, well done, Steve. Back in the game. Keep the faith. I thought let's start with a positive mental attitude and what could possibly go wrong for the next half an hour or so. How's things? <laughs> You're always trying to get me positive, Jack, because you're the most positive man I know, and uh, I appreciate it. And I do delve into those comments, and I really do appreciate the support that uh, that, that I get on there. there there's some, some people who have stuck by me through some, some difficult times. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm obviously feeling feeling good. I'm feeling relieved. You know, re- relief is the, is the main thing. Yeah, my, my brain had become attuned to things going wrong. You know, over the last couple of months, I've had so many near misses. And, and on Sunday, even when Burns was going up the last hole with a two-shot lead, I just assumed disaster was waiting. I thought maybe a loose chicken from one of the sponsors' farms might trip him over and injure him or something. And then when he hit that, he hit that last shot in the bunker, I thought, oh, what's he going to do there? Is he going to get a terrible lie leaving? But yeah, you know, this is the negativity that creeps into your brain after a, a bad run of, of, of near misses. But yeah, you know, Burns was was so solid, wasn't he? His driving was just obscenely good. His irons were dialed in. Uh, he found 63 greens in regulation, 63 of 72 Remarkable. greens in regulation, gained 15 shots on the field from tee to green. And he could afford to have his putter wrapped in ice for the entire tournament. The 57th best putter last week, Sam Burns. Uh, he managed to win by being the 57th best putter. He's normally a great putter. I think he would have won by about a dozen shots with a, with a standard Sam Burns putting performance. Yeah, it was a delightful, wasn't it, ball striking performance. And, and you're excited about Sam Burns. It feels like there's two players you're, you've been really excited about over the last couple of years. Sam Horsfield on the European Tour, who's faded away a little bit. And then Sam Burns now with his second PGA Tour victory, this time at the Sanderson Farms Championship. This guy's got a bright future. I think so. Yeah, yeah. He's got a lovely technique. He's blessed with effortless power. As I say, he normally putts well. He's up to world number 18 now. Narrowly missed out on the American Ryder Cup team. I mean, yeah, we would have liked to have had him in our team, wouldn't he, in the European team? You know, that, um, you know, the next sort of set of players that are coming up for the Americans is so strong. You've got your Will Zalatoris as well. We mustn't forget him. So, um, yeah, I think Sam Burns is going places where well, he's already gone places. And I think, yeah, potential major champion. Any other notable performances away from Sam Burns? Of course, we must mention you did tip him up in your Racing Post Sport uh, column and also on the sweet spot. So a nice 18 to 1 winner for for followers. Um, Aside from Burns, anyone else that impressed you? Yeah, I like Cameron Young. I thought Cameron Young was was excellent. He he showed great composure. He hits it miles. Uh, He finished tied second in that. So um, he's already won twice on the Corn Ferry Tour. I think Cameron Young was the the big take from the Sanderson Farms. I was a bit worried he was going to pit Burns at one stage. Um, So I think, yeah, I think Cameron Young will win soon. And then on on the other side of the pond, uh, we'll come on to the Dunhill links in in a second, I guess. Um, You know, John Murphy was a a new name name to us, wasn't he? Uh, You know, he played in the Walker Cup, but we didn't know a lot about him. But he tied for ninth last week. On his third, only his third European Tour start. So um, yeah, just one bad swing on Sunday into the gorse bush. But yeah, another one to keep an eye on is John Murphy. Yeah, seamless link there, Steve. Let's talk about the Alfred Dunhill. It was won by Danny Willett. I, I don't know about you, Steve, but I'm a big fan of Willett. And I think he described his career as being incredibly up and down. Of course, a Masters champion then fell all the way down to nearly 500th in the world. A couple of Rolex series events won since then. And then a, a, a fairly convincing win in the Alfred Dunhill because that top 10 was packed with quality, wasn't it? Yeah, he's a top class player, obviously, but he's had a few illness issues this year. He got COVID in March. He had a wisdom tooth removed in April. Then he had emergency appendix removal in June. And when they did that, they they spotted a hernia as well. And they pulled the hernia out at the same time. So he understandably has been struggling in this perform this year. But he slowly got back to his bed. Yeah, it was a sudden, sudden burst of form last week. He's back with his old caddy. I don't know if you spotted that. Jonathan Smart, who he won 
the Masters with in 2016. Um, they got back together in April, but obviously they've had these difficulties with the illness. But yeah, I was pleased for for Jonathan Smart and and, and Willett to get back, uh, you know, get back to winning ways. But yeah, the luck of the draw is so important in the Dunhill, isn't it? And um, playing Carnoustie on a calm day in round one was was the key to it. Um, and you know, Willett took advantage of, of of a good tea time on on Thursday because Carnoustie is the, is the dangerous track. You don't want to be playing that in the wind. I mean, only one player in the eventual top five, did not play Carnusti on that Thursday. Um, Joachim Lagergren. Come on, let's let's speak <laughs> about him. Joachim Lagergren, 100 to 1 um, anti-post. You tipped him up, runner-up. I mean, I was looking at the leaderboard on that Sunday and I was thinking, here we go, here we go. There's, there's a possibility he might win this. Uh, we were, I do feel like we were really, really, really close to a 100 to 1 winner there. Yeah. I know it was a two shot margin in the end, but yeah, the putter just let him down at some key moments. He had a short lip, birdie putt lip out on the 11th. Uh, then he bogeyed the 12th straight after that. Another short birdie putt on the 16th. So even on the 16th green on Sunday, if he knocks that putt in for birdie, puts enormous pressure on Willett and he just missed that one. So, um, you know, in contrast, Willett hold from off the green at the 10th. I don't know if you saw that one. That was an absolute Sunday afternoon hammer blow. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah I, just, I just think we were we were close there. But um, yeah, yeah, we mustn't grumble. No, it absolutely. Been one of those days when he when he finished second, I thought uh, I thought the writing was on the wall for Sam Burns there. But fortunately, we we got uh, we got there in the end. I must say, I take um, huge enjoyment sitting in a in a nice warm living room watching players just getting battered by wind and rain. Are you are you similar to that, or do you like to kind of imagine the blue skies and and plush green greens? Well, I certainly didn't feel much jealousy. Yeah, I normally feel immensely jealous of the the, the, the PGA Tour stars enjoying the sunshine in Florida and whatnot. But yeah, it looked yeah you know, it's colder than it looked actually. I looked at the temperatures. You know, they didn't didn't get past 14 Celsius all week in in Scotland, and and the wind was whipping for the final three days. So uh, yeah, Willett did well to hold himself together there. And um, yeah, Joachim Lagergren, you know, he's a fantastic Daniel record. We, we might have to consider him again next year. Every year he turns up for the Daniel, lowly ranked, massive price, and performs. So um, yeah, well, we went 12 months for that one. <laughs> yeah, well done to Willett and Sam Burns. Uh, let's move on then to this week. Two brilliant tournaments to preview. Uh, let's start with the Open de España. And this is a really intriguing um, tournament because other than the... It's a, it's a fairly strong European tour field. And then you add to the mix a certain John Rahm. He heads the market around 9-4, to 2-1. to one. Bernd Wiesberger, 20-1. to one. Migliozzi, 33-1. to one. Karamora 40 to 1, Perez 40 to 1, bigger the rest. Steve, I, I was just looking at some stats this morning, and Ram is genuinely phenomenal, isn't he? He's won seven times in 53 starts in the European Tour, in kind of regular European Tour events, excluding majors and WGCs. He's won six from 16, I think. Yeah, um, that's right. And he's going for his hat trick this week. I can't remember the last time I saw a player going off this short for a, a regulation tournament. Um, how are we playing it this week? Well, let's discuss the course first because, uh, you yeah, know, we, we've been two years since we, we've been there, obviously, because COVID destroyed the Spanish Open last year. So it's the same course, but not since 2019. Club de Campo, Villa de Madrid, 7,112 yards. So very short course, par 71. Uh, this millennium, it's hosted the Madrid Open from 2001 to 2005, the Madrid Masters in 2008, and then that 2019 Spanish Open. Um, old fashioned parkland track, tree lined, undulating, small greens, tight in places, but it's proved very easy for the tour pros. The scoring's usually ridiculously low. Great weather forecast this week, no wind, should be another birdie fest. And uh, the course record is I Vagina. I always like to mention that the course record holder at this course is I Vagina. I Vagina shot a 60 in 2005. Excellent stuff. So with that being said, let's start with how many tips you've got and then let's let's de delve into the nitty gritty. Well, yeah, we obviously got to have a huge Ram chat, as you say, because uh, he's nine to four favourite and we are going to have five each way alternatives. We're not okay. back in John Ram. Yeah. So it, 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 let's let's start with that then. Ram, obviously, the, the stats don't lie. He's the best player in the world. He's phenomenal. But is it just the price putting you off? He is very short, isn't he? I can leave him alone at nine to four. He, he flopped in the Fortinet Championship. He's a flopping favourite last in his last stroke play event. He went off four to one for the Fortinet, putted really poorly, missed the cut by two shots. Uh, this is going to be a really low scoring event, as we say. It's a short track, only three par fives. Is this course difficult enough for the undisputed best player in the field to demonstrate that superiority? I don't think it's ideal. I mean, if it's a glorified putting competition, which you, you could call it, 
you don't want to be back in Rama at short odds. His strength is ball striking. He finished 42nd in the PGA Tour putting stats last season. You know, he's the player of the year for me. You know, Patrick Cartley controversially got player of the year. Rahm's the player of the year for me. He was 42nd in the PGA Tour putting stats. I mean, it all worked out for him in 2019 on this track, but he putted really well that week. He was first for putts per greens and regulation. Can we be certain that John Rahm's going to putt well this week? I don't think uh, we can be we can certain about that. Um, you know, he might win by stiffing every iron shot close, but at a top whack nine to four with questionable motivation. You know, remember he's yeah he's got a young son at home now. I wonder whether there's some regret about leaving this event on his schedule. Heavily involved in the FedEx Cup playoffs, five matches at the Ryder Cup. He's invested a lot of emotional energy lately. Um, yeah, I just wouldn't be surprised if this was an unspectacular week from John Rahm. You know, he's priced up to just hose up. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I punched Mike Tyson's boxing glove there. I didn't mean to do that. Might hit you back. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave Mike Tyson alone. Uh, yeah, I, I just I just can't get excited by the price. I know, no, that, I, know, I know this is a simple tournament for a lot of punters. You know, and in, particularly after a winner, you know, a lot of Sam Burns punters might just want to pile back onto to John Rahm. But no, you've got to play the value. And for me, it's not there. So who is the value for you this week then? A good friend of John Rahm's, in fact, and someone who's not intimidated by John Rahm, which I think is important because it's difficult to imagine Rahm not featuring in contention. Um, Adri Arnous. Adri Arnous at 50 to 1. Uh, he grew up playing alongside John Rahm. They get on great, actually. They're, they're childhood friends. Uh, and, and, and Arnous has played well in, in three balls with Rahm. In the 2019 Spanish Open, at this course, they played together over the first two days. Arnous beat Rahm on both days by a shot. Uh, went on to finish fourth in the tournament. Uh, so back at the same course this week. And Arnus has been playing all right in, in the lead up. He finished 12th in the Italian Open a month ago. Uh, missed the cut by a shot at Wentworth. Good effort on a track which really doesn't suit him. And then last week, 24th in the Dunhill Lynx. And he had Carnoustie on the Friday. Very windy Friday. Shot 76 at Carnoustie on the Friday. So he's unlucky with the draw. Um, and yeah, we've discussed this in the past, you and me, off, off air, haven't we, about Adrian Oost? Because I, mm. I, I was a... I was in love with Adrianus, and then I just stopped backing him for a while because the putting stroke put me off. Yeah. Um, and he's made significant strides with his putting this year. Uh, he is third on the European Tour for putts per greens and regulation. He is sixth for strokes game putting. It's been a sensational improvement on the greens this year from Arnus. He's got a great record in European Tour events in Spain. So, uh, yeah, I think he's the Spaniard that, that, that represents the value. And and of course his putting's improved, but I was lucky enough when I when I went out to uh, this is a terrible name drop when I went out to Dubai last year I was on the range and our noose was was next to me and I, you just look at him and you're like this is one of the most brilliant golf swings I think I've ever seen because he's tall and he's quite gangly but he just oh it was just an absolute joy to watch so our noose um, Steve Palmer's main bet for the Spanish Open Steve who's up next. Next best is Guido Migliosi at 33 to 1. Two time European Tour champion. Another one who I don't think would be scared if he got into a duel with John Rahm. I think Adrianus would be inspired by that battle. I feel the same about Migliosi. He's shown plenty of guts in his career already. Uh, this year he finished fourth in the US Open on his major debut at Torrey Pines. Astonishing performance. He's been second three times on the European Tour this year. Decent warm up last week, 17th place in the Dunhill. He was sixth at Valderrama last year in the Andalusia Masters. Uh, I think he's going to take a shine to, to Club de Campos. It's his first visit, but I can see uh, Migliosi going very well. And, um, you know, he's got the balls for it. 33 to 1. It, it, it feels a big price, that, about Migliosi. Is, is it kind of being skewed a little bit because of because Ram's so short? Because you often see, you know, Migliosi going off 20 to 1 or shorter recently, don't you? He looks the obvious alternative to me. Uh, Bernd yeah. Wiesberger is getting great respect in the market. Um, yeah, Bernd Wiesberger played three matches at the Ryder Cup, three you know, three defeats. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, for, yeah. Guido Migliosi was the one that when I immediately saw saw the field, I thought he's the one that's perhaps going to provide the biggest challenge to Rambo. And then I couldn't believe the Adrian News price. I, you know, he opened up at sixty to one. I thought it was astonishingly big value. So, um, yeah, th those are my ideas of the biggest threat to John Rahm, Adrian News, and Guido Migliosi. Hit me with your third, then. Come on. Then we get some bigger prizes. Uh, Matty Schmidt. He decided he yeah. wants to be called Matty now rather than Matthias. So, yeah, this seems to be a trend amongst golfers. Frederick Jakobsen started it. Frederick Jakobsen officially changed his name to Freddie Jakobsen <laughs> uh, a few years back. Cameron Davis did it and now wants to be called Cam Davis. They all just want to be, um, you know, have less serious monikers. But uh, what would you be, Steve, if you wanted to? You can't really. Steve, maybe? 
It's not really not... short on it, can you, Steve? Stevie, you can call me Stevie. Stevie if you Palmer, but, um, that's nice. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I'd have to extend it. It's like yeah, Stevie okay. Palmer, but um, yeah, Matty Schmidt. All credits for him. He's a German. He obviously got a bit of a you know a sense of humour. A German with a sense of humour. He wants to be known as Matty. He doesn't take himself too seriously, but he's got a very serious golf game. You know, he's a supreme ball striker. Two-time winner of the European Amateur Championship. He had a, a decent stateside college career behind him. Uh, and he rapidly made an impression on the European tour. He was 14th in the BMW International in his homeland in June. He was low amateur in the Open Championship. And more recently, runner-up in the Dutch Open, ninth last week in the Dunhill Links. And we're talking about all these players that were suffering in the winds at Carnoustie on Friday. He played at Carnoustie on Friday and shot a 68. Yeah, this this fella is, um, he looks like the real deal, real deal to me. He's got a wonderfully fluid motion through the ball, mm. isn't he? Um, yeah, I think a, a European tour breakthrough from Matty Schmidt is coming sooner rather than later. It's feasible this week if Rahm underperforms. And is Matty Schmidt still wearing that top that resembles a sort of football shirt with Germany on the back? He does love his nation, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he has really been, loves it. Yeah, yeah, he has been wearing that more often than not. But um, yeah, yeah, no, he, he loves his Germany and all credit to him. Good. Who's up next? Another German, Maximilian Kiefer. He also played Carnoustie last Friday in those strong wins. Didn't handle it like Schmidt. Shot 75, missed the cut. But Kiefer always misses the cut in the Dunhill links. He doesn't like links golf. It's much better for punters to judge him on the form he showed in his previous event, the Dutch Open. Finished 15th in that. And Spain seems to bring out the best in, in Max Kiefer. You must remember the uh, the 2013 Spanish Open. Uh, Let me have a think, Steve. Hang on. Um, you, you no, I don't 2013? <laughs> Just about. <laughs> The 2013 Spanish Open, Rafael Jacqueline and Max Kiefer, nine hole playoff, two hour long playoff, which Jacqueline ended up winning. Heartbreak for Kiefer. Uh, he went back to Spain and finished second again in April, runner up in the Gran Canaria Lopez and Open to uh, Garrett Higo. He was fifth in the 2014 Spanish Open. He was fifth in the 2018 Andalusia Masters. He'd been knocking on the door of a European Tour breakthrough in Spain. This week, I think you'll like the course, uh, tree lined, tight tree lined track. Very accurate player, Kiefer. So, yeah, I think he can go well at a big price. Big price about the second German this week. And your final tip for the Spanish Open, Steve Palmer. Francesco Laporta at 125 to 1. Another typically accurate operator. Laporta full of beans at the moment. He secured his European Tour playing rights with a brilliant September. Fourth place in the Italian Open. Sixth in the BMW PGA Championship. He was also fourth in the Irish Open in, in July. He's never made a cut in the Daniel Link. So it, it, the, the same with Kiefer. Ignore the missed cut last week. Doesn't mean anything. Uh, this is a course you should like this week. He won the Challenge Tour Grand Final in Spain in 2019. I think he goes close to more more glory in Spain uh, this Sunday, which happens to be his 31st birthday. Ah. But yeah, happy birthday for uh, for Francesco and a you know, happy Spanish Open for his backers. Because it was Willett's birthday when he won, wasn't it? Oh, there you go. Oh, has that ever happened double. before? Back-to-back -back birthday winners, I wonder. Oh, my gosh. That's one for Kevin Perlane to look into yeah. and get his, date, get his database out. But yeah, I'm, I, I, sure, I'm sure we've got it. a sweet spot viewer, Steve, that will be able to tell us. So tell us in the comment section, have we ever had back-to-back -back birthday winners on the European Tour? We may have found a little angle from Steve Palmer's tips this week. Isn't it? I've never been more excited about a golf tournament <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, let's move over to the PGA Tour, where it's the Shriners Hospital for Children Open. Uh, this one in Las Vegas. Um, Steve, you're, you're you're freshly oiled up with your with your, your the carbonated drink there. Uh, talk us through the course for this. this they've tour. actually shortened that mouthful of a name there that you were struggling through, Jack. They, they, they've 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 named it the Shriners Children's Open this year. Oh, okay. Years. Well, I, well I, I, I strung it out so you could take more of a, of a, of a gulp. I, I appreciate that. They finally got it right. They've had so many name changes for this one. I think they finally nailed it. Um, so, yeah, we're at TPC Summerlin, Las Vegas, Nevada, 7,255 yards, par 71. Summerlin has been part of this event since 1992, but it used to be a multi-course event since 2008. We've had four rounds at Summerlin. Very easy track for the pros. Normally serves up a birdie fest unless the wind blows. No breeze forecast this week. Both tournaments, you know, fair. You know, it's going to be no draw, draw bias. You know, all, last week we were all fretting about draw bias, spending all week looking at Scottish weather forecast. <laughs> this week, this week, both tournaments set fair with no wind. Um, so, yeah, we're going to see lots of birdies and we're going to get fair events. Other than sort of bookmaker websites, I really do think the most visited website for the likes of you, Paul Keeley, must be weather forecast websites. Paul Keeley is always on some kind of 
uh, weather forecasting app, seeing the wind <laughs> like Plumpton or something. Just uh, <laughs> I, it always amuses me. Let's quickly have a look at the market. Then Brooks uh, Kepke, a favourite, twenty-two to one, uh, alongside Victor Hovland, uh, Scotty Scheffler, also twenty-two to one. Answer twenty-five to one. Last week's winner, Sam Burns, twenty-five. You've got Webb Simpson, Ustays, and Kevin Nar. A really strong field this one, Steve. And who is your main selection? Uh, so I just. Thinking about Paul Keeley now makes me chuggy. Whenever I used to hang around, we always talk about bottomless ground. I think he's always obsessed with rain, wasn't he? For me, it's always wind, which is most yeah. important. For him, it's rain. And he goes, oh, it's going to be absolutely bottomless. It's going to be bottomless. You know, it's just always made me chuckle. Anyway, sorry. Has, has there ever been a time when you and uh, Paul Keeley have, have been together? He's kind of looking ahead to a big festival. You're looking ahead to a a big tournament and just really kind of looking into the weather. Because the, oh, I'd yeah, love yeah, to that's... be a sort of fly on the wall in that in that room. No, that's it. That's it. No, he's obsessed with rain. I'm obsessed with wind. What a, what a life, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the winners this week, well, the winner of this one is Scotty Scheffler. Okay. Um, the 25 to 1, I believe, is gone now. General 22 to 1, but I think still think that's extremely fair. I think Scotty Scheffler came of age in the Ryder Cup. You know, what a debut that was. He was the captain's pick, which was raising most eyebrows in the American golf in public. You know, all the Patrick Reed fans, all the Captain Americas were going, oh, where's Patrick Reed? Well, Scotty, yeah, Scotty Scheffler, PJ Tour made and picked ahead of him. It was a leap of faith from, from Steve Stricker. And then not only that, he's then handed Bryson DeChambeau as his partner. You know, yeah, he's, got to, he's got to deal with the pressures he's feeling himself. Then he's got the volatility that comes with, with handling Bryson DeChambeau. It's a really tough assignment. Scheffler passed it with flying colours. Scheffler and DeChambeau halved with John Rahm and Tyrrell Hatton in the day one four balls. Then they beat Tommy Fleetwood and Victor Hovland the following day. Then Scheffler faces Rahm in the Sunday singles, thrashes him four and three. So two and a half points from three matches. Scheffler is an instant Ryder Cup hero for his country. Confidence levels must have gone through the roof. He's been threatening a maiden PGA Tour title for ages. He's a two-time winner on the Corn Ferry Tour. He was runner-up in the WGC match play in March. I think his time has come. Missed the cut by a shot in the Shriners 12 months ago. Not worried about that. At 25 years of age, Scotty Scheffler's moment has come. And Scotty Scheffler, that name is just born to be a successful sportsman, isn't it? Scotty Scheffler. Such a powerful Chef. name. Yeah, I call him the chef. He's going to serve <laughs> up a treat. There we go. The chef to win uh, the Shriners Children Open. I think I got that right, was it? Shriners, Shriners? Children's Open, yeah. There we go. We got there in the end. Uh, who's up next, Steve? Best bet. Next best, Sam Burns. Oh, going to in again. Dangled by one firm. Sam Burns. There's no way I can abandon Mr. Burns after the way he performed last week. He had the ball on a string for 72 holes. Would have won by half the track with a standard putting performance. We know the putting green will be where he's spending the next couple of days. He was ninth, He was the ninth best putter on the PJ Tour last season. So um, don't you worry. The rock rolling will will, will come back. Um, yeah, he won't need to do any work on his swing. Yeah, he won't be tiring himself out between tournaments. Mm. He can just recover from his Sanderson Farms exertions. And because he had that cold putter, he, he never had that burden of front running, really, did he? You know, he, he timed his run to absolute yeah. perfection. It was like a horse just sort of, easing himself up and like, you know then the jockey just gives him a little tickle and <laughs> away he goes i mean he did that they just the, the start of the back nine it was it was funny on friday saturday and sunday the start of the back nine he just owned those that collection of yeah. holes he just went on a birdie charge on those ones so i think he's got plenty of energy left in the tank sam burns back-to-back -back wins entirely feasible after he won his maiden title the valspar in may finished second uh, in his next event. There was a week off in between, but I still think that's encouraging. He had a month off before the Sanderson Farms. I think the short game comes back this week. I think we need, yeah, we're in Las Vegas. Let's leave some chips on the table. <laughs> I, I don't there's, there's, many things, but you know what I'm on about. There's no concern then, because golfers often talk, don't they, after a win, how mentally shattering it is. There's no concern that that could creep in this week for, for Burns? No, because he was front running for about four holes, wasn't he? I mean, he's... um. You know, I, I watched his media conference afterwards. That only went on for eight minutes as well. So he just, okay. normally you have like half an hour in there. You know, he, he got that done in eight minutes and he's on his way home. He only lives two hours down the road. Now, I, I think there's plenty left in the tank for Sam Burns. And, um, you know, we need to go again. Hopefully it's good, another good week for Sam Burns, who's Steve Palmer's second best bet for the Shriners Children Open. Who's third, Steve? Third is another old podcast favourite, Maverick McNeely. Oh, yes. Shorted up at 50 to 1. Yeah, my love for Maverick McNeely is no secret. Uh, I think McNeely, Scheffler, 
and Will Zalatoris are the three best maidens on the PGA Tour. I'm certain all three of them will win plenty of titles over the fullness of time. McNeely's come really close this year. He was runner-up to Daniel Berger in the Pebble Beach Pro-Am in February. He was runner-up again last time out in the Fortinet Championship. You know, he led the Fortinet for a long way and just messed up the 71st hole. Did you see that one? He just yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He took an iron off the tee on the 17th, wafted it out to the right. It was his worst swing of the week by far. Um, left himself miles back. Then when he got to the edge of the green, he, he was over-aggressive. He felt he needed to hold his chip. He didn't as things turned out because he eagled the last. But, yeah, that calamitous double bogey on the 17th meant he lost the tournament by a shot in the end. Uh, I think he would have learned a lot from that. Some of his scrambling when he was leading that event was just awesome. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's world class. He just needs to tighten up a little bit off the tee and, he, and he's got everything. Summerlin is a course where you can attack. His de- you know, desert golf takes pressure off the driving. Uh, he knows the venue really well. He lives in Las Vegas. McNeely lives in Las Vegas. He practices here a lot. His coach, Butch Harmon, is based 20 minutes down the road. He hasn't played since that fortnight. I think they've been tuning up for this one because they know it's a great big opportunity. Steve, you mentioned there about the iron off the tee, trying to get yourself in position, wafting out right. For me, that's the most frustrating shot in golf. You're trying to play safe and it goes wrong. What is the the shot that you play where you just really boils your blood? You're right. Anyway, amateurs, well, I'd speak for everyone, but for me personally, I haven't got a safe shot in the bag. We've got like a stop <laughs> shot. Yeah, you could. I suppose the putter might be might go straight, but no, every club in my bag is really erratic, so I might as well take the driver. I normally do take the driver. I mean, you've played me, haven't you? you well, you've you got the that. sold your putting there. That Scotty Cameron that was running hot when we played. Oh, putting, yeah, yeah, putting, putting's easy. Putting's easy, but but swinging a golf club's really hard, and yeah, I'm wild. So uh, yeah, I'd, uh, yeah, dry, uh, get the driver out try and get somewhere around the green, hack it from there. And then, yeah, as soon as I'm on the green, I reckon I could beat Tiger Woods in a post. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, let's hope you won't, you wouldn't beat Maverick McNeely this week though. Uh, who's your fourth tip for this tournament? Fourth and final tip is Matthew Wolf at mm. 45 to one, who uh, switched back to an old set of irons last week. The same irons he used to finish runner up in the U S open last year. The same irons he used to finish runner up in the Shriners children's open last year. Um, Matt Wolf carded the third round 61 in this event 12 months ago. He ended up losing a playoff to Martin Laird. Uh, he closed with a 65 for 18th place on his Shriners debut in 2019. So this course, clearly a great fit. He was 17th last week in the Sanderson Farm, 65-68 over the weekend. That's real encouragement for Wolf fans. You know, From the US Open onwards, he's, he's looking good again. Um, we all know how good he is. Um, I think he'll get his career back on track this week. He's only 22. Yeah, you know, I don't want to get get into the, the mental issues, but he didn't enjoy lockdown. Um, you know, COVID sort of messed Matt Wolf up more than, than most golfers. Um, but he's getting, you know, we're getting out of COVID. He's getting his head together. I think you'll get back to winning way soon. I, d- I don't know why I remember this because I, I could never really remember what I've had for dinner the previous night. But you just mentioned Martin Laird there. Can you remember his bunker shot in this tournament last year? Unbelievable. That oh, Martin my goodness. Laird, you know, this is second victory. He's, he, he, second victory in this. Yeah, Martin Laird, real horses for courses, man. You know, he, he, a bit like jo- Joachim Lagergren in the Daniel, really. You know, form leading up to the event doesn't seem to matter. He, he, he just produces in this event. So, yeah, I mean, some people will be back in mind there. There's, there's that was the one of the most phenomenal. It was plugged, wasn't it, in the face and just kind of hacked it out and just trickled down left to right into the cup. Amazing shot. Uh, OK, brilliant. The Spanish Open and the Shriners uh, Children Open. Uh, just give us a run through your, your tips for this week, Steve. Spanish Open, Adrianus, Guido Migliosi, Matti Schmidt, Max Kiefer and Francesco Laporta. And in the Shriners Children's Open, Scotty Scheffler, Sam Burns, Maverick McNeely, Matty Wolf. Maybe he'll That's... change his name to Matty. <laughs> he, <laughs> um, takes it the op- he takes it very seriously. He calls himself Matthew at all times. So he's the I opposite of Matthias Schmidt. Have you, ever, have you ever been in a situation where you've like shortened someone's name without asking them and they've got a bit funny about it before? I love doing that. I love Do doing you? that at the supermarket. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, they have the name badges on. <laughs> or where any shopper go and they've got name badges. Yeah, m- my wife hates it. But I, j- I just think, what are the name badges for? This So you start some sort of relationship with these people so yeah if i see a name there i'll shorten it and be over familiar and they normally they love it is that Um, over kind of the the butchers or the 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 kind of cashier counter bit do it every time you see a name badge jack just use it what's the name badge there for if nobody uses it talk talk to them by their name and and be 
really friendly and nice. Be kind. Hashtag be kind. And and people think this show is just for for golf tipping. There's that oh, solid we're, we're, life advice. That <laughs> it really we're full is. of advice. We're full of advice. What are you up to uh, this week, Steve? Before we go, it's always nice to know what, what's going on in in the Palmer household. Well, we had a lot of illness in the camp. You know, no, none of us four seems to be fully healthy at all times. So it's like, you know, getting everyone fit and healthy and enjoying the golf again. You know, I'm obviously really excited after a winner. I just, to use football parlance, I needed one to go off my arse. You know what they say about the strikers. I just felt like, yeah, I was getting all these near misses. I just needed one to go off my arse. Now I've got my confidence back now. I think we could go on a little run because we had a good start to the year, terrible middle. And now hopefully we'll have a finish and flourish and, and get back in profit for the year. We're not that far behind for the year now. That was a, you know, we had a decent stake on, on Sam Burns last week. So, um, yeah, get get my family healthy and and enjoy as much golf as possible and hopefully get um, get a couple of winners. I thought we were going to have both winners last week. I'm quietly confident we're going to have a successful week this week. And I must do some shout outs. You were doing shout outs at the start. I must do some shout outs because there's been, you know, I get lots of emails from people during, you know, when you're on a losing run, you need support from readers because you, know, you, you worry, I worry about letting them down. And uh, I must do some shout outs. Joe, John Owen from Formby, must always mention John Owen from Formby. Steve Blighty Blight, Steve Blighty Blight has been sending me all sorts of great emails to keep spirits up. Adam Chamley, Stuart Eads, Frankie Burton, Alex Mansfield, Colin Fitzpatrick, Martin McKibben, Alex Hack, Johnny Byrne, Mark Waller. Alan McCracken, Mark Bellew, Dave Kelly, Ben Young, Kevin Hasnip. And we've even had some lady supporters. You know, I'd like, Brilliant. You know, obviously, you know, it's not being sexist to say our audience is largely male, isn't it? But la- la- that's not sexist to say. That no, 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 that's what I say, Steve. I was having a look through the YouTube analytics of this is a bit nerdy. Oh, were the, you? The split of male to female. You and Bruce really do bring the ladies in, I must say. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, I didn't realise that. I never know how to do any of that stuff you're on about. But I did notice we've had a couple of ladies who have done supportive comments as well. Tiffany York and Margaret Forshaw. So thank you. you very much. All those people. I definitely miss people out. We get so many nice comments. I apologise if I missed you out, but I really appreciate your support. I'm doing my best. I'm sorry we had a bad run. I'm hopeful we've turned the corner. It's and, you know uh, it's, it's brilliant when people write in. I, I remember when I first joined the Racing Post, a good you know, a few years ago now, and and there's a little section in the office where all the post comes to, and I was waiting on a package. I think it was something like a microphone or something. So I'd go there every day to see if my package had come, and there's a big pile of post that comes in every day, and you're flicking through, and it's Steve Palmer, Steve Palmer, Steve Palmer. The amount of letters you used to receive to the office. I don't know if they ever got to you. Yeah, but yeah, it was yeah, a yeah they do. Number of letters. Really? No, no, it's great. It's great. And I need that because I'm one of these very weak characters who needs like 100 positive comments to overcome one negative comment. You get one negative comment, it destroys me. But then if I get 100 good ones, I feel all right. So I really, really appreciate all the support, particularly the ladies out there. You've really, really, really excited me now. I've got so many ladies. I must well, start I doing my hair. Nice, right? Put your nice collar on and everything for it. Well, I've, I've got a hat on because my hair's in such disarray at the moment. So, um, yeah, maybe I need to sort of sort myself out a little bit if we've got lots of lady viewers. I didn't know that. Excellent. Thanks so much, Steve. It's always a pleasure uh, joining the, the sweet spot uh, while Bruce is away. Uh, Bruce and Steve will be back next week to preview the CJ Cup and the Andalusia Masters. Uh, until then, please do remember to gamble within your means. Only ever bet with money you can afford to lose. And we'll see you all again very soon. Bye bye. <laughs>